Welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Autistic Brain, the first in our three-part Changing Minds series. I'm Clay Whitehead, the co-CEO and co-founder of Presence Learning. We provide live online speech therapy, occupational therapy, special education instruction, and counseling to thousands of children across the country every week. Starting with today's program, we're bringing you the perspective of some of the world's top experts to help you sort out some of the complex issues related to neurodevelopmental disorders. Today's guest, Temple Grandin, needs no introduction. She has been featured in the New York Times, The Today Show, People Magazine, Larry King Live, and, my favorite, Fresh Air with Terry Gross. She has authored or co-authored about a dozen books, most recently The Autistic Brain, Thinking Across the Spectrum. She is also the subject of a BBC documentary and a biographical film starring Claire Dane. Please enter your questions for Temple in the chat box to the left of your screen. Watch your email for a follow-up message to get the recording and slides for this presentation. The response to this webinar has been so phenomenal, we had to increase the capacity of this room multiple times. That demand is a testament not just to Temple's fame, but to her message, which is fundamentally one of a better world that can be achieved through people of all types working together. You would think with a message like that, the messenger would be a pie-in-the-sky idealist, but Temple is a down-to-earth realist. She has lived the struggles and talks about what it means to be on the spectrum, at least as we currently define it, from a practical perspective, as well as from the perspective of someone who is a scientist and researcher. Temple herself has revolutionized how we handle livestock in this country, seeing things that others could not by dint of her extraordinary visual thinking. Through her life and work, she has also helped a broader swath of society see the untapped power and the promise of those on the spectrum. She reminds us that different minds are just that, different, with different strengths and different deficits. As Temple sometimes says, without autism, there would be no Silicon Valley. Whether it was called personalized or differentiated instruction when Temple started talking about it, I don't know. But... I do consider Temple one of the most effective and consistent proponents of personalized instruction for children on the spectrum. Presence Learning sees the power of this every day with our students in live online speech and occupational therapy sessions. Of the thousands of students we serve in over 30 states, over 40% are on the spectrum. And the progress that they make with intensive personalized therapy of the type that Temple advocates are amazing. I remember one child, Lily, that had an occupational therapist of ours who worked with her uh, online to provide strategies for coping with sensory issues and social phobias. Lily's challenges were so severe that she could not go to public events, and her mother was afraid to take her out of the house for fear of a meltdown occurring. Lily's family soon found that she was able to make incredible progress with her online therapist because she found the interaction less intimidating and overwhelming than traditional therapy. She loved the safety of working with someone via video conference. The therapist leveraged Lily's love of hummingbirds and her favorite hummingbird toy, among other strategies, to help her and her family learn coping skills. Within months, Lily was able to attend her first public event in a very long time, her brother Joshua's school play. That night was a gift in many ways not the least of which was the small sense of victory and progress felt by her mother, who had felt unable to leave the home with her child for a long time. The mother wrote us, saying, We are forever grateful to you in helping Lily overcome her social phobias to where she is now, outgoing and friendly. After all of Lily's public school traumas, the Presence Learning format was her first critical step to trust people again and experience positive, enjoyable interaction. Successfully attending Joshua's school event, shows how far she's come. I think that what brings everyone together to listen to Temple today is the shared understanding that children on the spectrum need not just our protection or understanding, but our belief in them as valued individuals and the individualized attention to back that up. We all wrestle with how we can help children on the spectrum live up to their full potential in our public school system, which may not always afford these children the individualized opportunities that they need. All too often, their individualized needs are trumped by a forced focus on IEP minutes and paperwork deadlines. What is the way forward? The future of public education for children on the spectrum is up to everyone on this webinar and your colleagues to continue advocating for strategies that work, like personalized learning, 
can help bring these ideas to a national scale. The impact, if we do it right, is tremendous. Not just to serve our own students, but to set a high standard that benefits all students. The education of children on the spectrum is still ours to shape. And with that, I want to turn it over to Temple, the national expert on this, to lead us in our thinking. Thanks, uh, Clay, for the introduction. And I want to thank everybody for being here um, on this webinar today. And I got lots of different things we're going to talk about. Let's talk some today about diagnosis. And one of the things about diagnosis, it is not precise. People act like it's precise. I have people come up to me and they say, was my kid PDD-NOS or is he Asperger's? PDD-NOS stands for Pervasive Developmental Disorders Not Otherwise Specified. Now, the thing about the diagnostic labels is they're half based in science, and the other half is based on doctors sitting around conference room tables in hotels trying to decide what the category should be. Now, nobody sits around conference room tables in hotels deciding what the diagnosis of tuberculosis is. If you've got tuberculosis, there's very, very precise tests that can tell you if you've got tuberculosis. When I went to Australia, I had to check off on the customs form that I've never had tuberculosis. I can definitely check that off because the diagnosis of tuberculosis is absolutely precise. Autism is a behavioral profile. And it's unfortunately a huge behavioral profile. Now that they've changed the DSM, they've taken out all the language delay stuff. So now you have this huge, huge continuum going from probably Albert Einstein and Steve Jobs and half of Silicon Valley down to a kid that's very, very, very handicapped. You know, the kind of core deficit is going to be the social communication issues. But it's a huge, big spectrum. I think it's a lot better to just look at what kind of problems the child is having. If he's having problems with making friends, then let's get him into a special interest group, like maybe art or mathematics or Boy Scouts or 4-H or um, being in the school play. If he's got problems with um, his homework or something, then you work on that. If he's got a behavior problem, you work on it. I'd rather just ask the parents or ask the kid, what is the kid's problem? Let's forget about the autism. What is specifically the kid's problem? Okay, if it's a little kid and he can't talk, then you do a lot of ABA type of applied behavior analysis stuff. Uh, there's also programs like the Denver Start program that are effective. What's important is 20 hours a week with an effective teacher. I don't really care what program you use. Well, you've got to get that kid talking. Let's just look at what, the more, what are the kid's specific problems than looking at the autism. Kind of break it down. And I talk about that in my book, The Autistic Brain. So if you fit a certain behavioral profile, then you're labeled autistic. Now, the thing is, a lot of these traits are continuous traits. In other words, there's no black and white dividing line between bipolar and moody, between sadness and depression, or between autism spectrum and maybe just being quirky and a little bit uh, geeky and not very social. Now, the thing I want everybody to think about is what would happen to these two people today? You got little Albert, no language until age three, how would he be diagnosed today? Speech delay, autism, nonspecific learning disorder? What would happen to him? How many medications would get so piled onto him that he wouldn't be able to think straight? How about little Stevie, bullied in school? Oh, a weird loner who brought snakes to his public school and turned them loose? And the thing that saved him was getting into the teenager's computer club a local neighborhood computer club, where he got in doing an activity that he could do with his peers where it was a shared interest. You see, the problem we've got with the autism spectrum, it's a very, very big spectrum. And at one end of it, you've got a lot of people that work in Silicon Valley. At the other end, you've got individuals much more severely afflicted, never are going to have speech, may have epilepsy, cannot tolerate a normal environments like noisy restaurants because of all the sensory problems. And I think lots of times it's really difficult for teachers to shift gears from, okay, maybe someone like Steve Jobs Jr. to somebody that's got a lot more handicaps. It's a very, very big spectrum. Now, how did you get such a big spectrum with the same name? Well, when the kids were really little, they looked the same. 
I had no speech until age four. And a child that's going to become verbal looks just about the same as a child that's not going to become verbal. That's kind of universal. You know, now we're going to call it social communication disorder. Well, I think some of that's politics trying to narrow the spectrum some. Now, as I travel around, I've been asking a lot of people how these changes are going to affect, you know, getting services. I think it's going to vary tremendously from state to state. You know, because I have found as I travel around that some states were much more likely to have more Asperger's diagnoses than other states. People get too locked into the label. Now realize now we have to have labels to get services. I think we need to be looking at what is specifically the kid's particular problem. Let's get a whole lot more concrete and a lot less abstract about this. And I'm seeing situations where a mildly autistic kid, I'm going to just say a geek or a nerd, actually gets held back by the label just because of the way it's perceived. And to get any service at all, they've got to have the labels now. I mean, let's say a kid gets diagnosed with dyslexia, ADHD. Well, in that situation, you've got a fully verbal kid that can talk. The behavior problems are way less. It's a much more narrow spectrum. And the big problem we've got now with autism is you're throwing somebody that ought to be working in Silicon Valley into the same group with somebody with huge intellectual challenges. It's, it's a whole bunch of apples, orange, grapes, and walnuts and everything else mixed together. And the problem is there's too much top-down thinking, too much abstract theory. This is not the place to get abstract because when I go in my other world, meatpacking plants, go out in the tech world, uh, go in the cattle world, I see people that have mild autism and or Asperger's all over the place in good jobs, like head of the plant engineering department, uh, programming computers, uh, breeding Angus cattle, just all sorts of things. And uh, they, don't, they don't have the label. They're undiagnosed. Now I want to get into different kinds of thinking. This is the kind of stuff I really, really like. I'm a visual thinker. The HBO movie did a great job of showing how my visual thinking mind works. And being a visual thinker really helped me in my work designing livestock facilities. Now the thing is, I didn't know that my thinking was different. I thought everybody was a visual thinker. And it's really helped me to learn that there are different kinds of minds. Now I am a photorealistic visual thinker, or an object thinker. Can't do algebra. Now, another kind of thinker is the pattern thinker, the spatial thinker. Music and math mind. Often these kids have trouble with reading. This tends to be the pattern. So there's two types of visual spatial thinking. There's photorealistic pictures, like me, and then there's the pattern thinker that thinks in patterns. See, in your brain, you have circuits for what is something. That's where I excel. Another type of circuit is where is something. That's where the mathematician excels. They're your programmers, your engineers. But let me tell you, you engineers and you programmers, you need us art people. You're going to need us to prevent really, really serious mistakes. And I'm getting worried that we're going to get screened out. Let's not be doing them. You need us. Another kind of specialist mind is the kid that loves history. So it's all about verbal things, writing. Then you get some individuals, especially some labeled dyslexic, where they're an auditory learner. They learn best through their ears. I was a kind of learner that learn best through my eyes. And then you can get mixtures of the different thinking types. Everybody now wants evidence-based that it, there is a picture, object, visual thinker like me, and then there's also a more visual, spatial, mathematical mind. Okay, so how can you tell what kind of mind a kid has? Well, usually at three it doesn't show up. But when kids get around third or fourth grade, that's when you'll start to see really good at art. Or the kid will start to take off on math. Uh, you want to bring them interesting things to do. Some of the kids that are great at math, oh, they love origami because that's patterns. Well, then start having to make origami. You know, building, uh, there's various building sets that you can, you can get. Uh, a lot of hands-on things. Uh, kids that are good at writing, they'll start to be good at writing. Then you can have the kid that's good at writing, but his handwriting's horrible. Well, there's a point where just let him type on a computer then. I like to use the music mixing board as sort of a model for personality traits and how the genetics works. You know, and you can slide these little sliders and adjust it. Maybe one's for depression and sadness. Another one's for seeking. You got some people that want to parachute out of planes, jump off of cliffs and do all kinds of dangerous stuff. That's high seeking. Other people are high fear. I wouldn't be caught dead, you know, 
skateboarding on some of the ramps that some of these guys skateboard on. I like to watch it on TV, but I wouldn't be caught dead doing it. I'm too high fear for that. And all these little snips in the genetics move the slider on the mixing board just a little bit. You know, where does normal start and abnormal begin? It's not black and white. Really important concept. I'm teaching kids on the spectrum, and kids with a lot of learning problems. Thinking is bottom up, not top down. Most people's thinking is top down. You form the concept, and then you try to shove all the data into it. My thinking is bottom up. I get all the little details and put them together to make holes. So let's say I want to teach the words up and down. Use a lot of different examples. I went up the stairs. I went up in the attic. The plane flew up in the air. I threw the ball, the ball up in the air. You know, words like down, on. Use different examples. Okay, how about more complex concepts like rude? Well, sticking out your tongue in church is rude. Pushing in line at the movie theater is rude. Um, you know, and you have specific examples. This is probably one of my most important slides. We've got to develop the abilities. And when you have a diagnosis, I don't care if it's dyslexia, ADHD, autism, ASD, developmental delay, global something or other, that's another one of their new categories they've made, um, social communication disorder, learning problems, whatever label they slap on the kid, depending upon the state and what services you can get with different labels, there's a tendency to have uneven skills, to be good at one thing and terrible at something else. I can't emphasize enough, build on the kid's area of strength. You know, when you get labels, I don't care if they're ADHD. In fact, there's research now that shows there's a lot of genetic crossover between autism and ADHD. See, a lot of these different labels have a lot of genetic crossover in a real, real complicated sort of way. One of the things mother did with me is she always encouraged my ability in art. Take the thing the kid is good at and build on it. But then you've got to broaden it out. You know, some kids just want to do constant anime characters. Well, let's do the anime character's car. Let's do his house. Broaden it out. If he likes uh, airplanes, let's draw the airport. Let's draw a place where the airplane goes to. If the kid's a mathematician, Let's calculate the speed of the airplane, the time it takes to go different places. Too often there's a too much emphasis on deficits. I'm seeing bad situations where you have a third grader, super good at math, and they won't let him do the harder math. They make that kid do baby math over and over again. You want to have a behavior problem? That's a really good way to make a behavior problem. You're going to have these uneven skills, and we've got to build up the strength area in things that can turn into careers. And this is why it makes me so sick that schools have taken out things like auto mechanics because there's really good, um, good careers there. And for a certain kind of kid, not all kids on the spectrum, that would be absolutely a, um, a great career. Also, people need to understand some of these sensory issues. And this is just not limited to autism. You can have dyslexic kids with sensory problems. You can have um, ADHD kids with, learning, uh, with sensory issues. And these are real issues. There are some kids that maybe can't tolerate the noisy cafeteria, and they're going to need to eat somewhere that's quieter. Um, we need to just figure out, you know, simple things we can do. Again, I'm a visual thinker, so everything I think about is specific. And, and uh, don't overgeneralize about this stuff. You go, okay, now what exactly is little Tommy's problem? You know, let's not look at autism. What is this, what kind of problem are you having with this, this kid? People have got to break out of their silos. You see, I, all my career, I've been a silo buster. You know, I go over to Silicon Valley, I visit Silicon Valley, and half the people in there are Asperger's or mild autism. But they've avoided the labels. You know, when those kids are like eight years old, they get apprenticed into computer programming. They're the lucky geeks. And then there's some other kids getting addicted to video games. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got some very severely afflicted kids that need a completely different kind of service. It's kind of like when autistic kids are very young, it's lots of early intervention, it's pretty much the same. Then when they get to later elementary school, they kind of diverge into like a group that's gonna have a lot more handicaps, remain nonverbal, and a group that's you know, 
may have, you know, intellectually normal in at least one area and can fully talk. And they've got to learn the social skills. And they've got to be coached in a concrete way. All right. Because what we've got to look at is skills that they can um, uh, use when they get out in the workforce. So first of all, biggest thing is I've got to tell teachers, forget about the label, because the autism label has gotten so broad now that you just can't treat all the apples, oranges, and grapes all the same way. But I can't emphasize enough building on the area of strength. I just cannot emphasize that enough. Because every person on the spectrum I've seen that's been successful out in the workplace um, is in, an, in a job that uses their strength. Let's talk about sensory. My top priority area for research would be sensory. Now, one thing good in the new DMS-5 is that one of the characteristics of the autism spectrum disorder is sensory problems, sensory oversensitivity, these sorts of things. Now, you can get sensory problems, comorbid. All that means is in conjunction with. Well, I mean, the medical profession really just think up some really awful words. And all that means is associated with autism, dyslexia, learning problems, ADHD, Asperger, head injury, oppositional defiant. All these different labels often have sensory issues. And the thing about sensory issues is they are extremely variable. And they vary from a nuisance to being so debilitating you can't tolerate normal environments. And you can get them at the high end of the spectrum and at the low end, end of the spectrum. One kid may have sound sensitivity. Another kid has visual sensitivity with fluorescent lights. Another one has food sensitivities. They are extremely variable. Now, when a kid gets overstimulated, there's two ways they can kind of deal with it. Throw a big tantrum, like in the middle of the supermarket, or go into shutdown, where they just shut the entire world out. See, the problem we've got on the sensory stuff is there's so many subtypes. You cannot study sensory problems just based on autism or not autism. And what's, not, what's the mistake that's being done on studying sensory issues is they're not saying, um, all right, let's take the kids that can't stand the regular standard tubular 60-cycle fluorescent light, and we're going to study them. Or the kids that hate the smoke alarms, the mic feedback, you know, those sort of noises. Or the kids that have taste aversion. You know, they need to be put into sen different sensory problem groups. And then you could start to study them and find out what works. You know, so I'd try different things. Some kids respond to slow swinging. Some respond to deep pressure. Some respond to um, a lot of heavy work types of things where they got to lift and carry stuff. You know, try different things and, and, and see what works. Some kids really respond to singing, and they can learn to speak by singing words because singing is different circuits than, than words. But, you know, other things that can help on some of the sensory things, yeah. I take some B vitamins and some magnesium, that can help, omega-3 supplements. Sometimes the teeniest, tiniest dose of spiritual, really tiny, like a fourth of a milligram a day, extremely tiny. And, you know, exercise is, is very calming. So you try things and you see what's working. Things that are not working, then don't do it. And there's a lot of things where you have to keep doing you know, some people say, well, OT doesn't work because you've got to keep doing it. And I'm going, wait a minute. You've got to keep taking blood pressure pills or they don't work. Okay, auditory problems. Loud sounds hurt the ears. Take some of the sounds that he has problems with, maybe get it on a really high-fidelity recording device. Put it on a low volume and let him turn it on. Sometimes you can get to where you can tolerate a sound if the child initiates it. And he's had too much, you can stop it. Give him some control over the stimulus. Sometimes you can desensitize on sound sensitivity doing that. Maybe the hearing fades in and out like a bad mobile phone. All of this stuff gets worse when they get tired. And then slow down, enunciate the hard consonant sounds. Let's just forget about the autism. We've got a behavior problem with the kid. Okay, the first thing you've got to figure out, is it biology or is it behavior? Examples of biology would be Loud noises hurt the kid's ears, so he screams when the, the uh, school bell goes off. Or maybe I um, uh, can't stand all the noise in the cafeteria. It's just sensory overload. And in my autistic brain book, I talk a lot about problems with, um, with sensory overload. There are some kids that just can't tolerate certain uh, you know, loud noises. Um, uh, 
you know, you sometimes can work on desensitizing it if the child's allowed to initiate that sound. Some kids can't tolerate the old-fashioned 60-cycle fluorescent lights because they can see the flicker. Now, an example of behavior problems is some of these kids are master manipulators, and you've got to have the same discipline between home and school. Like if I had a temper tantrum at school, the, the rule was no television that night. Temper tantrum at home, no television that night. Because too often I'm hearing, oh, he behaves just fine at home and he's horrible at school, or he's good at school and he behaves terrible at home. Parents and teachers have got to get together on the same page and make some you know, definite rules. But you've got to like get a whole lot less top-down in your thinking and more bottom-up in your thinking and go, okay, now is it a biological problem, like a kid can't stand all the noise and stuff in the environment, or is it bad behavior? You've got to categorize your problem. Forget about, just let's just forget about the autism and let's just concentrate on the sensory, because you can have children with other labels that also have problems with sensory oversensitivity. ABA is sort of the granddaddy of the early intervention treatments. And ABA was done on, with me as a child, but it was called Miss Reynolds Basement Speech Therapy School. And then you have Denver Start Model. And, and there's different methods. Don't get too hung up on this. Uh, the important thing is getting enough hours of one-to-one -one face time with an effective teacher. And I'm talking about the two, three-year-old and four-year-old kids, little nonverbal, little tiny kids. And a good teacher knows just how hard to push. And that teacher could be a grandmother. It might be a student. And this is not rocket science. You've got to be observant and a, and a good observer to sometimes figure out problems in nonverbal kids. Like maybe hidden painful medical problems that they've got that they can't tell you about. You know, let's say the kid's been good and now he's terrible. Maybe he's got acid reflux. He's got heartburn. He's got an earache. He's got a yeast infection. He's got a urinary tract infection, some hidden painful medical problem. Or maybe it's a sound sensitivity issue. Or maybe it's the fear that the smoke alarm's going to go on. Because a smoke alarm went off in that classroom last week, and now he's scared to death to go back in that classroom. Or a mic screeched, and he's scared every time he sees a mic, he's scared it's going to go off. I kind of got that way about balloons. And one of the ways I could get better about some sounds is if I initiated the sound. The other thing I had to learn is I had to learn how to deal with anger. I got kicked out of ninth grade for throwing a book at a girl who teased me. And um, after I went to the special boarding school, I got in another big fist fight, and the kid teased me. And then I switched from anger to crime. Well, when the space shuttle was canceled, and you can look up the 60 Minutes episode, and the scientists were crying and walking off camera. That's why they had those jobs. It's okay if you're a computer person and you cry. That's okay. And keep your job doing that. When I was in the meat plant, so I'd go hide in the electrical room. It had a great sign, kept everybody else. I was just going in the electrical room. Nobody knew I was in there. That was the whole point, because I didn't want them to see that I was crying. But I'd been throwing things. I wouldn't have had a job. It's just that simple. The worst thing you can do with these autistic kids, little autistic kids, is let them sit in the corner rocking and tuning out. You, I was allowed to have an hour a day where I could tune out. It's okay to have some downtime where they're allowed to stim and allowed to calm down. But then the rest of the time, you need to be tuned into the world. So what are the outcome measures? I'm all about outcome measures. Well, if we can get them talking, then you did the right thing. Okay, how do we deal with problems like bullying? I was horribly bullied in high school. Elementary school went pretty well because I had all the hands-on things to do, making stuff and art. Well, in high school, the girls weren't interested in making stuff and art. But the refuges I had away from teasing were the specialized interests. Horses, electronics, and model rockets. This is why it's so important. Get kids involved in the specialized interest things. You know, things like FFA, agriculture programs are really good. Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, maker community groups, all these sorts of things, great things. Another big problem with a lot of the different diagnostic labels, whenever there's a problem, is attention shifting slowness. When there's something developmentally wrong with the brain, or you've had a head injury, you tend to take a longer time to shift back and forth. Head injuries rip circuits in half, especially long distance circuits that go across the brain. Developmental disorders, they just don't grow. But tension shifting slowness. Okay, give the kid time to process. You might say, uh, let's say you want to ask the kid to, um, you know, to go get his notebook or to put his notebook in his desk. Well, 
If you've got an attention shifting problem, you might hear the word desk and the word notebook that clipped out. So you're going to say, Tommy, I need to ask you to do something. Put your notebook in the desk. I've got to get the channel open first. Now, there's some individuals that are labeled dyslexic, ADHD, or autism spectrum, and they have trouble with reading. And they'll complain about seeing the words jiggle on the page. These kids also have problems with organization of the writing. I'm finding that one out of 50 or 60 students that takes my livestock handling class has this problem. These students are usually really bad at drawing. They are not your artists. These kids tend to be more of an auditory learner. You got a kid who's got a problem with reading, ask him if he ever sees the print jiggle on the page. Does he hate fluorescent lights? Does he hate escalators? If it's an older person that drives, do they hate driving at night? And sometimes this can be helped with pale colored Erlen lenses. It can be helped with colored paper. It can be helped with changing the, the computer screen background. And make sure you use only tablets and laptops. Those are the only screens that don't flicker. Other screens are bad. I think schools need to use a variety of approaches. I was a phonics learner. Dick and Jane books did not work with me, and Mother taught me how to read that just sounding out my words. First of all, you need to get a book that's worth reading, the kid's are going to be interested in. Other kids are sight word learners. I've seen sight word learners messed up when they had, phonic, when they had phonics jammed down their throat. So I think the best approach is you use a combination of approaches when you have a, a kid in any kind of special ed kid. You, you know, try some phonics on him. Try some whole words. You know, try some different methods on him. And then use the method that works. Don't get too hung up on, we just do phonics or we just do sight words. I think that's completely wrong because if any of your special ed kids, they are going to be different. And some will work with one method and some will work with another method. Now, I want to make it very clear that I am definitely a big supporter of professional guidance. You know, and that would mean that there'd be a meeting and a session with the speech therapist or the occupational therapist at least, you know, at least once a week um, uh, so you get progress and then that therapist can give you more homework to do. So it's professionally guided. A lot of schools I find only to do two hours of speech therapy a week. Well, I tell parents, and well, get, you know, go to the church and get some volunteers to come in and, and uh, watch what the speech therapist does and then do a whole lot more hours. One thing every expert will agree on is that at least 20 hours of face time with a real live person, one-to-one, -one, is needed to help these little ones pull out of it and get language. Everyone will agree on that, and then they're going to fight over all the methods. Just don't get hung up on it. Over and over and over again, parents will say to me, what's the most important thing you can tell me about autism? Well, if the child's three or two, I can say 20, 30 hours a week of early intervention. That's the same. But once I get away from that, I've got to have a whole lot more information. We have all kinds of ages here. Let's start out with the three-year-olds. That's where you've got to do lots of intensive intervention with a speech therapist or another teacher many hours a week. We've got to get the kid talking. Now, once we've got the kid talking, then he's got to learn social skills. And let's just do it out in the real world. I was brought up in the 50s, and kids were just taught table manners. Kids need to learn how to go up to the McDonald's counter and order a hamburger. Um, mother would have me dress up in my best dress, and I'd be party hostess at her parties. And I had to shake hands with the guests and talk to the guests. I'm seeing kids that don't even know how to shake hands. they got to just learn these basic skills. And you need to just do it out in the regular community. You know, how do you buy a ticket at the movie theater? you got to take them out and, and do it. I've seen really stupid things that were done, where they took a kid and they made him set and unset the table ten times, and they blew a big fit. You know, today kids don't do social groups where they just get together, four kids get together, make up their own game, make up their own rules, negotiate. When you grow up, it's called work skills. And the other thing on career readiness, kids have got to start learning job skills. And I think it needs to start at around 13, and we need to find paper route substitutes. If there's no paper route, then he can walk dogs for the next door neighbors. He can set up... Um, chairs at the synagogue or the church or whatever every weekend. He can work in the farmer's market. And when they're 16 or 14, depending upon the state, they can get a job in a store. Got to learn some work skills. And I saw a very good program that's been written up in the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders, a paper in press by Wayman, Dr. Wayman. And uh, he uh, talks about a thing called Project Search. And you can look it up online, Project Search Autism for keywords. 
And when kids are last year in high school, uh, they get a job at a hospital where they work in a hospital where there's job coaches and it's all set up. And boy, their employment rate is 87% versus 6%. This is on a randomized uh, controlled experiment. Uh, Got to learn those work skills. And the other thing that schools have done, which I think is horrible for career readiness, is taking out all the hands-on classes. Cooking, sewing, welding, wood shop, art, drawing, all these things that can be turned into careers. What a person on the autism spectrum needs to do is sell their work rather than themselves. But the other thing we got to do is just work on setting up things. Let's just forget about the labels. Let's just call some of these kids on the high end of the spectrum quirky and different. And and you set things up where they where the last year of high school they do an internship with a local uh, employer. But have to learn those work skills and just figure it out in the neighborhood. I think on the job readiness, middle school, that needs to start. In elementary school kids, let's have the parents have them doing chores. You know, they've got to take the garbage out. They've got to, you know, clean the bathrooms in the house or something, you know, some kind of a chore. And then middle school, we need to start doing our paper route substitutes. They've got to learn how to do stuff that other people want. That's really, really important. Okay, let's say, for example, um, you have a friend that owns a candy store. Well, your kid, the minute he turns 14 in Colorado, can work in that candy store. Other states, it's, it's 16. They've got to start learning those skills. And we need, to, we need to have a slow transition from the world of school to the world of work. Not just come out of high school, boom, there you are. You've got to be doing working long before you leave high school. And I had lots of job experience working on my aunt's ranch. When I was 15, 16, I cleaned out eight horse stalls every day and took care of the horse barn. I was building projects. I was painting signs for feed yards. I was doing a whole lot of things. I did an internship at a research lab where I had to rent my own house. How did that get set up? Well, my mother and the college just got together and set it up through contacts. It cost nothing to set it up. Okay, you've got Facebook and stuff that, like that today? Well, you can find people with that. You know, when social mistakes are made, don't scream no. Give the instruction. Like, if I forgot to say please, although what Q means say, you forgot to say, boy, in, in the 50s, they was pounded in. And a lot of the kids that were mildly on the spectrum in the 50s got no labels, and uh, they've been employed because the social rules were pounded into you in the 50s, and those pounded into all the kids. Because I'm seeing too many kids ending up playing video games on Social Security. I'm hearing a story over and over again that's really bad. He's 17, I can't get him out of the basement. He's 22 and brilliant in math, I can't get him out of the bedroom. And we already applied for disability on Social Security. No, they never learned a certain, a single work skill. You know, my generation, boy, they had paper routes. Yeah, you had to deliver them every day at 6 o'clock. Well, now we can replace that with dog walking. Or maybe you have to buy groceries for the lady that uh, has difficulty walking. Or you maintain the neighborhood community website. You know, something that's a job. And we need people to fix cars. Utility workers, you know. Uh, utility companies don't know what they're going to do when their 50-year-old people retire. I'm seeing too many quirky kids kind of going nowhere. You see, the problem we've got in the autism spectrum is it's such a big spectrum. And a lot of teachers don't know what to do with quirky nerd. He gets put in with some kids that are much more severe. Then you've got the super severe kids where the, the parents are totally stressed out. This is something that mother's extremely concerned about. Mom's so stressed out they can't function because the kids' sensory problems are so bad they can't do normal activities. They can't go to a movie. They can't go to a restaurant. They can't do anything normal because the kid goes into sensory overload. You see, it's sort of almost like two different kinds of services here. You also give them choices. I was afraid to go out to my aunt's ranch. My mother said, well, you can go for all summer or you can go for two weeks, but there's choices. Or you limit the video game playing to an hour a day and you can do it when you come home from school or you can do it after you've done your homework. You can give them some choice. Now, some people might think I'm an old fogey that's just getting too anti-video game. Now, if they're learning how to program them, that's not what's happening. They're not learning how to program them. Mentors. I had a fabulous science teacher. I had some fabulous teachers, really, really great teachers. And I get asked all the time, public schools versus private schools, you know, I don't even want to hear about that. So much depends upon the particular situation and the particular 
people and the teachers. I mean, I'll have one family say, oh, he's doing great at the local pr uh, public school. Go over to another town and they're doing terrible. You know, it, it's, uh, it's so much to do with very specific, specific people and specific places to determine how well things are working out. I get asked all the time about homeschooling. Now, if you've got somebody on the high end of the spectrum and you homeschool them in high school, I think you need to start working. And there's some kids, and I was one of the ones that was tortured in high school, I had to be taken out of a regular school. It just didn't work. I went to special boarding school. And these other kids are just getting homeschooled and they're finishing up online, but they need to start working. And prior to 16, you figure out things in the informal economy. At 16, how about real jobs? And um, let's look at um, people on the more severe end of the spectrum. You know, people go, oh, there's nothing out in the rural areas. Well, I can tell you, great job for somebody that's maybe nonverbal. It's really useful work. You know, cattle don't like to drink dirty water. Somebody has to clean the water troughs. You're going to have, like, it's a big feed yard. You might have 20,000 head of cattle that are really, really going to appreciate what you do. They don't want to drink dirty water. And people that are nonverbal know the difference between fake work and real work. I'm very concerned that our educational system is not stimulating some of our visual thinkers and our pattern thinkers. I'm really worried about that. One of the worst things the schools ever did was taking out the hands-on classes. Art, music, cooking, sewing, woodworking, welding, metal shop, automobile fixing shop. Also, these classes teach practical problem solving because sometimes your projects don't come out right and you've got to figure out how to do it. Well, we need to be doing hands-on things. We've got to start thinking about accommodations that enable I'm seeing too many kids kind of overprotected and sheltered, where they aren't learning how to walk up to McDonald's and order their own hamburger. You know, they haven't done things like serving hors d'oeuvres at their, you know, their parents' uh, you know, parties, you know, to help you know, learn social skills. You know, and then there's some accommodations that are not good. Like, we're going to let the kid do his public speaking over Skype? Uh-uh. He's going to have to learn how to get up in, in front of the class. You know, we've got to look at things that enable. Wheelchair ramps enable. Some of the sensory stuff, we've got to, um, you know, give some protection against that. Now, one of the principles is you've got to stretch these kids. You've got to stretch them just outside the comfort zone. Mother had a really good instinct on how much to stretch me, to learn social skills. I'd dress up on Sundays, and my mother would have a dinner party, and I'd shake hands with the guests and serve hors d'oeuvres. had to, you know, and it was, good evening, Mr. Wood. Good evening, Mrs. Wood. There was no calling them by the first names. That wasn't allowed in the 50s. But that teaches social skills. And, and you know, in the 50s, a kind of more rigid way of bringing kids up, I think actually was good. Because what's happened to all of the people that I know that are kind of on the spectrum, that are my age, they all got jobs. One of the things my mother always emphasizes is it takes a village to raise a child. This is where communities need to work together figuring things out, like with these young 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds set up a little informal job, maybe somebody down the road has a little store, and you arrange for the child to go over there two afternoons a week and stock the shelves or clean up the store. You know, then this is where the you know, religious organizations, neighbors, businesses, teachers get together and just figure things out. And, but then on the other end of the spectrum, we've got problems with very severe autism you know, where the parents are absolutely frazzled out. I gave a talk one time in a large church in Dallas, and they had a respite night one, uh, one evening a month for the parents with very severe, not just autism, but other very, very severe problems where they could not take the child on any normal activities. And one couple spent the respite sitting in the air-conditioned car playing music. They just wanted to sit. They didn't go out to dinner. They didn't do anything. They were just completely at the end of their rope. Mothers have been working on uh, getting uh, different heads of organizations, talk together on the phone, conference calls. You know, people need to, like, get out of their silos. You know, there's a lot of different stuff going around the country. Don't, you know, reinvent the wheel. You get four people on a conference call, they can let down their hair and, and uh, really talk about stuff. The good thing is the kids love these devices. And I went to a wonderful school in Australia. They were using an iPad in a really good way, and this was with young children, you know, with four- and five-year-old children, real young kids. And they, to, to use the iPad, they had to take turns with another child. And this activity was done with a real teacher there. 
You know, I think in real young children, you know, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, all activities are almost all activities with any type, type of electronics need to involve interacting with real live teachers and other kids. And what they did in this activity is they, um, you put the iPad up um, to where each child has to go and go up to it, take his turn, then sit back in his chair. And then you can graduate to passing the iPad around, but they tend to fight over it. You first have to teach them how to, how to um, just one at a time go up and play the game and the other children watch. I was taught turn-taking with board games. Well, we can teach turn-taking with techno technological things, but it needs to be done with a real teacher, especially in these young children. We can't just let them zone out on, on games. You know, now later on, yes, maybe you get the Udacity website up, and the child um, is, uh, maybe this is a, a sixth grader or seventh grader, and he's taking online class in computer programming. Yeah, that's going to be on a laptop. That's fine. If he wants to get addicted to programming, fine. But too often, I'm hearing parents say, and I've been hearing this just in the last two years, they'll say, oh, he's 18, I can't get him out of the basement playing video games. And these are smart kids. He's 21, I can't get him out of the bedroom, he's playing video games. No, you've got to, you know, got to limit that, and, and you've got to take interest in technology and how could you make a career out of this? No, but real young children, we need to limit the solitary screen time. Absolutely have got to limit that. I want to give a little hint for the video game stuff. Kids right now are getting hooked on Minecraft, which I think is way better than the shoot 'em up games. If I'm going to pr promote a video game, I think I'd promote Minecraft. But one mom did a really brilliant thing to tie the technology back to the real world, and it was very successful. She went to the lumberyard, got a bunch of uh, two by fours cut up, and then uh, took them to her driveway and had the kids paint them and then do Minecraft blocks in the driveway. Really, they were just doing old-fashioned blocks like what we had in the 50s, but now we paint them with the Minecraft colors, and they become Minecraft blocks. You see, now you're getting a link back into that video game. We need to be thinking more ways to make the thing in the technology tie in to the real world, and it was very successful. She said every neighborhood kid wanted to come over and play with the Minecraft blocks. Let's say you have a kid that does not talk and, and, and isn't going to learn to talk. There's good apps for, um, like, Pro Logo to go and, and uh, programs you can use that he can use to communicate with. I'm all for that. Um, I'm not against technology, but what I'm against is kids just tuning out on, on screens and they're not learning how to, how to interact with people. You know, and even in older kids, we've got to limit the amount of, of, of video game playing and have them doing other things. Two books that would be really good for teachers to read that are just uh, starting out. Uh, of course, I'm biased, and I think my information is good. So I have a book called The Way I See It. It has a whole lot of little short chapters, you know, where you can just read about the thing that's a problem. Um, and The Autistic Brain is a really good book to learn more about the different kinds of thinking styles. Thank you, Temple. That was okay. wonderful. I have to say, this whole talk with you is a dream come true. I've wanted to know more about you and your work ever since I first heard about you. And from the size of our audience today, over 3,800 people, I'd say I'm not alone in feeling that. So many of our audience members have questions for you. Over 400 submitted at last count. Thank you to everyone who sent those in. We'll be spending the rest of our time together listening to Temple's answers. Here's the first one. We have a question from a young man who is 16 years old and is struggling socially. Temple, he would like to know what things helped you open up and add social skills to your everyday encounters. The thing that helped me was getting involved with shared interest groups. When I was in high school, the only places where I was not bullied was horseback riding, model rocket club, and electronics. I don't know what your interests are, but find something that be your interest. It could be band, it could be theater, it could be computer science. You know, find activities that you can do together where you get shared interests and shared activities. Even when I was in college, I got, got along much better socially after I was in a school talent show. So get involved with specialized interests with peers that have the same specialized interests. Temple, what did you do in the talent show? Oh, I sang a, I sang a silly song called My Buddy, and I uh, made um, a scenery for it. Wonderful. Um, there's not a recording of that anywhere, is there? No, there is not. 
Uh, here's another question from a teacher. Um, she wants to know, what are some ways that educators can help students transition from their preferred activities, like art or math, to non-preferred ones, like reading or history? Well, they like art and math. Well, there's mathematics in history. Uh, you know, let, in other words, work the subjects that they like into the other subjects. Okay, likes art and math. Well, you could read about famous mathematicians. In other words, make an associative link back to the thing that the child that's in, the, the child's interest. He could read. He doesn't like reading. Well, he could read about artists. Now, you also want to rule out some visual processing problems if he doesn't like reading. Some of these kids are really helped out with things like uh, printing the homework on different pale um, pastel colored papers. That sometimes helps. It doesn't help everybody, but it helps some people. You know, uh, history he may just not be interested in it, but try to work the subjects that he does like into the subjects that he does not like. Great. We have an administrator who's asking, how can teachers best prepare a classroom of students who do not have experience with autism for having a new classmate with autism? Well, kids with autism tend to be really concrete. Things have to be really explained to them. You cannot be vague. You know, you just can't say, well, you're being rude. That's too vague. So if the autistic kid does something rude, like maybe push uh, in place in line, uh, you have to say you need to wait your turn in line because it's rude if you push in line. Everything is learned by specific example. You know, people with autism have trouble with um, vague things. They also get scared when there's surprises. You know, if you're going to be doing a new activity tomorrow, it might be a good idea to warn them in advance that they're going to change the desks around tomorrow, but don't have that be a surprise. On the other hand, you've got to stretch these kids. There's a tendency of parents to overprotect these kids. Mother had a really good sense of just how much to stretch me. She'd have me be a little party hostess when she had parties. I had to uh, learn how to order food in restaurants. So I'm seeing too many kids that aren't learning some of these basic skills. You've got to stretch these kids just slightly outside their comfort zone to get them to develop. But remember, no surprises, and don't be vague. So we have another teacher with a question here. Uh, she asks, how can we communicate and collaborate with parents who excuse their child's behavior because of autism? I feel like we need to hold all students accountable for their actions, even students on the spectrum. All right, first of all, you've got to figure out what is motivating the behavior. See, one of the problems you have in autism, it's such a big spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, you've got half a Silicon Valley. You've got Einstein who didn't talk until age three. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got some kid that's nonverbal. So we have to figure out, if, especially with a nonverbal kid, is there a biological reason for some kind of behavior problem, like um, screaming in the classroom? You know, does a nonverbal kid have a hidden painful medical problem that needs to be fixed? Or... Um, or some of the kids have trouble remembering long sequences of information. There's also sometimes problems with sensory stuff. You know, the school bell goes off, it hurts their ears, or they're afraid that a microphone's going to feed back and blast out their ears. So it could be sensory. And then, then you've just got bad behavior. When I was a kid, the rules were the same at home and school. A temper tantrum, whether it was at home or, or school, equaled no television for one night. The rules were very clear. There needs to be consistent discipline between home and school. I've heard of situations where the child might be good at school, terrible at home, or good at home and terrible at school. You know, these kids need to have consistency. That's what they need to have. They've got to have consistency. So one of the most common questions we've been asked so far is this. What does online therapy look like for kids on the spectrum? We just want everyone to know that's outside the scope of this webinar, which is focused on Temple and her work. But if you want to search on Google, look up online speech therapy videos, and you can see what it looks like for yourself, or contact us to learn more. Temple, this, this is a new question here. I remember a story of a child on the spectrum whose strategy for doing the things he wanted to do and not doing the things others wanted him to do was simply to wait out all requests from adults until they gave up sometimes just sitting silently for hours. Well, I think we all know that sometimes, what was that, Temple? Uh, there'd be some penalties for me doing that. If I uh, had pulled a stunt like that, there would have been no television that night. My, um, you know, if I had a temper tantrum at school, my, the teacher would call home, and, uh, and uh, there'd be no television that night, or maybe now it's no video game at night. 
but if I'd pulled a stunt like being silent like that, there would have been a, a penalty for that. I mean, I would have been in trouble for that. There would have been a privilege I would have lost for doing that. So when you're dealing with children on the spectrum who you may feel are manipulating the adults in a particular situation, it sounds like one of your main recommendations is consistency and clearly linking a consequence with the behavior. Is that correct, or would Absolutely. you alter what I said in some way? Absolutely. You know, when I was brought up in the 50s, and I think you get kids on the milder end of the spectrum, you got kids that are absolutely fully verbal, and, and uh, you've got to have consistency. It, it's, um, I knew just which houses I could be bad in, and there were other houses where things were strict. You know, the 50s upbringing really helped me. You would talk manners. Kids were taught to say please and thank you. These things were done in a much more consistent manner. So when you had the kids that were just mildly autistic, they managed to just be kind of geeky and weird, but they grew up and they got jobs. See, the thing that drives me crazy is when I go out to a their tech company, I've been about to Google and I've been to Jet Propulsion Lab and I've been to Disney Imagineering and lots of places like that, and there's people, um, you know, older people that I know are on the autism spectrum working at these places, and they managed to get jobs. And one of the reasons is they were, social skills were pounded into them when they were young. That's what was done in the 50s. And then you take the young kids that are going to work in the tech industry. In Silicon Valley, they just apprentice them into the, into the field. And this brings up another thing, teaching work skills. This needs to start young. You know, a lot of these kids on the high end of the spectrum, I think a paper route would be just wonderful. I know that those are gone now, but we could substitute other things like walking dogs. But some of these kids are, are master manipulators. On, on uh, Let's look at a, a nonverbal kid. This nonverbal kid would scream when mother approached McDonald's because the kid knew that mother would stop. But when dad approached McDonald's he in the car, he didn't do this because he knew that dad would not stop. You see, this is, um, you know, uh, no, they're masters at, at manipulating stuff. But on the other hand, you've got to make sure the kid's not screaming because he's in sensory overload. So you've always got to figure out, do I have a biology problem or do I have a behavior problem? And things like a hidden painful medical problem, sound sensitivity, those kinds of things are biology. You don't, you, you, that's not behavior. You, you've got to categorize the problems. So, Temple, we have a new question here from a parent. They're asking, is it okay to put a high-functioning student with autism in a class with many severely autistic children? I think that's a really bad idea. And a lot of these high-functioning kids are actually gifted. Maybe not across all the subjects, but you might have a kid that's gifted in math that has trouble with reading or gifted in writing. And, and that kid definitely ought to be in the gifted class in the mathematics. But one of the problems with putting a little smart, um, geeky kid in with a bunch of more severe kids, he's not going to learn anything. No, I don't think that's all right. You see, this is the problem we've got with autism. Now that they've changed the diagnosis, it's gotten the spectrum so broad. You know, you're going from Einstein and Steve Jobs down to somebody that's, um, you know, working at a very, very low level. And then some of your nonverbal kids actually have like a locked-in syndrome where they can learn to type independently, but they still have a lot of handicaps. See, the problem we've got with autism is it's so variable. And when kids are little and you've got no speech and you've got weird behavior, autistic behavior, Everyone will agree you need lots of early intervention, hours and hours and hours of educational early intervention. But then once you work on these kids, they kind of divide into two groups that actually need, you know, really very different services. The Temple, you just mentioned the word gift a couple times. Do you yes. remember the first time you thought that you might have a gift? Well, I was very good at art. And my ability in art when I was in third and fourth grade was always encouraged. We need to be building on the area of strength. And my career in design work was based on art skills. Too often we emphasize deficits and not enough emphasis on the areas of strength. So you, you've also mentioned a couple times early intervention. Um, but, but let's think about a little bit older kids for a moment. Yeah, well, that's right. We have a right. question yeah. here from a, a teacher that says, how can we support young adults with autism after school age support drops off? All right, uh, young adults, um, if they're fully verbal young adults, they need to be learning work skills long before they graduate from high school. I've been very interested in this new project search where um, kids in their last year of high school are working at jobs. 
and I mean responsible jobs, things like sterilizing, you know, heart, uh, you know, heart surgery equipment. I mean things that are responsible jobs in a hospital that become their jobs after they leave. We have got to train in work skills long before they graduate. When I was 13, I was um, mother got me a sewing job. When I was 15, I was cleaning horse stalls. Uh, we've got to teach these work skills long before they graduate, so you don't have a sudden transition. You know, and, and, and even with somebody that's on the more severe end of the spectrum, what's going to happen after they age out? We've got to start doing that before they graduate. You talked a little bit about the speech therapy you got and the need for intensive intervention, the need for 20 hours. But can you talk a little bit more about the actual therapy that you got and what you found? Well, I got, I, got a lot of a, I got a lot of ABA-type therapy, hmm. you know, one-on-one. -on -one. And she would say, cup. And then I'd try to say, cup. And I had a hard time getting my words out. And she'd say, cup. And then she'd say, cup. But she'd enunciate those hard consonant sounds. And, and uh, you know, there's now research showing some of the other intensive methods like Denver Start also work. But the important thing with these little ones is you've got to get a lot of one-on-ones with these little kids when you first see the abnormal behavior. So we have a question here from a special education director. Uh, he's asking, how do you explain the need for sensory breaks to classroom teachers? That's a really good question. Well, I... I think one of the ways to explain it would be to say to the teacher, just imagine you were just in, you know, you might have had a time where you were in a lot of traffic or you were at some really noisy place and you just had had it. Now the problem that you have with the autistic kid is a kind of noise and commotion that will set off that same response in you and with something really noisy is at a much lower threshold. You know, this is where the sensory, the whole sensory system is more sensitive. Some kids um, actually do need sensory uh, breaks. So it, it was, this is a related question, Temple. I thought it was a very powerful moment uh, when you spoke about going into the electrical closet to cry when you're at work yep. and feeling overwhelmed. Uh, and I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. We, we have a question from a teacher on the subject of safe places that I think you'll have a valuable perspective on. The teacher says, Please ask Temple to describe what a safe place looks like for an overwhelmed child. It needs to be some place away from the other kids, and the bathroom is not the place because other kids are going to come in and see you there. And the reason that I don't think the electrical room is the safest place to go, I mean, I knew what not to touch, so I wouldn't recommend going to the electric closet. But I needed to go someplace where the other people were not going to go in there. I mean, I had another place. I went in the plants. I would go underneath the stairs. They also had a big catwalk that went over the cattle yards, and I'd go up there, and people could see me up there, but they couldn't tell I was crying. Uh, it could be going outside. It could be, uh, mm -hmm. but it just needs to be some place where, where you're away from the other. Uh, I wanted to be away from my peers, basically, when I was upset. So, what is the most common mistake you see teachers make with kids on the spectrum, Temple? Well, one of the things is a lot of people just don't understand sensory problems. And and uh, you know there's some and you can work on sometimes desensitizing sensory problems. Um, uh, one thing that can help is let's say microphone feedback. That's a real bad one. We'll let the kid take the mic and he walks up close to the speaker where he's controlling how much it squeals. And sometimes you can get them to um, uh, to tolerate it. I had a mom write to me and said that her teacher write to me and say that they couldn't get this child to wear shoes. And I just suggested, why don't you try massaging and deep pressure and rubbing his feet, rubbing his feet with towels, then maybe he'll tolerate the shoes. It turned out that he, that he did. You know, that helped him to teach him to tolerate the shoes. And I recommend, you know, working with an OT. They know how to, you know, do these sorts of things. But sensory problems are real. I think it's really hard for people that don't have sensory problems to understand an alternate reality. I said, well, just imagine if we put a headset on you and we turned up the volume way higher than what you wanted it. Or we just put flashing lights in your eyes that were, you know, you just couldn't get away from. You know, and we just put you in sensory overload. I tell people it's like being inside the speaker at the rock concert. I don't think that's a place you want to be. So in your talk today and other places where we've seen you speak, you mentioned the importance of turn-taking games. 
Yes. What, what are some of the turn-taking games that you played, and why do you think they are so important? Kids have got to learn how to take turns, and I was taught with a Parcheesi board because right after World War II there were no children's games. And Parcheesi, you got to shake the dice, and then you got to move a little uh, round, um, around pieces around the board. And I had to learn how to wait my turn, shake the dice fairly. You know, you've got to teach that turn-taking. I mean, that's so basic. I went to a, a nice school down in Australia where they had um, – a, a, a children's Curious George video game projected on a smart board, and each child had to go up and take their turn while the other three kids sat in chairs and watched. And you start out with two chairs and then graduate to three chairs. They've got to learn to wait and take their turn. These kids are very impulsive, and it helps them to learn you know, how to inhibit a response. Also, these kids have got to get exercise. I mean, I know some schools don't have recess anymore. I think that's terrible. I, in the 50s, the approach to school was recess, run around, scream, run all the energy out of you. And then you had to come back in the classroom and you had to sit. But, you, but that recess was really important. Yeah, was it important uh, in terms of sensory issues or in terms of social and other types of learnings that you got? Well, I, it was sort recess. of for me just sort of get away, exercise. Uh, there was this one swing at our school, an elementary school, that slid down a track and I would just go on that by myself, and they let me do that on that swing for the 15-minute recess. And then the, in the classroom, I had to be tuned in. You know, like that was kind of my sensory break. I would sometimes I'd go out with the other kids and go down the slide, but other times I just would go on this one swing. So a special education teacher wrote in and said, "What technique or concept was most beneficial to you in learning to understand the nuances in conversation?" nuances in conversation, it's just specific examples. You know, like somebody might come up in a sarcastic way and go, oh, that's really nice, and, and they were trying to say just the opposite. Now, I've learned how to, to uh, understand that, but again, it's specific examples, and somebody has to explain it to them. I think the best way to think about working with some of these kids, imagine they're from a foreign country, and everything has to be explained. Like, for example, if I went to the Middle East, it's extremely rude to pick up and show the bottom of your foot. Now, I would have no way of knowing that unless somebody told me. Now, I just kind of imagine that just about everything is sort of that way. So you have things where, where there's nuances um, in meaning. It, it, you, the, everything is learned by specific example. It just has to be explained. It's sort of like filling up the database with more and more specific examples because my brain was equipped with a really good search engine. But to understand something in the future, I had to, I had to like dig up stuff in my memory to compare it to. It's a great example of the bottoms up versus top down thinking you talked about. That's there. right. Basically, it's bottom up thinking, not top down. You see, top down thinkers tend to overgeneralize. I don't know how often I get asked, my kid has behavior problems in the classroom. I, I couldn't even begin to answer that question. I don't know how old the child is. I don't know how verbal the child is. What did he do in the classroom? I couldn't even begin to answer that. I have the same thing when, when I'm at an animal behavior conference. They do the same thing with dog questions. I'll say things like, my dog is crazy. Well, I don't know. It. What did the dog do? Bite somebody? Jump on somebody? What did it do? You see, I have to have a lot more detail. Over, when you go overboard on top-down thinking, I think that's what's caused a lot of the educational fads is just going overboard on abstract top-down thinking. I have a question uh, um, about, about your childhood, and it's about how your mom worked with the teachers at the school. How did she work with a teacher at the school, and what advice would you give to parents as they talk to their own teachers? Well, fortunately, I went to a small school, old-fashioned 50s classroom, 12 kids in a class, and mother and the principal and the teachers worked really close together. Mrs. Deach was the third-grade teacher. She kind of you know, ran the whole school. And, and Mother and Mrs. Deach were in contact all the time. If I had some kind of problem, you know, uh, like let's say I threw a tantrum at school and Mrs. Deach would call and Mother would say, when I got home, well, there's no TV tonight. You were stomping around on the, you know, laying on the floor at school today. And just working very together. The parent and the teacher have got to be working hand on hand. So the rules and everything are the same in both places. You know, the worst thing is to sort of have parents against the teacher or teacher against the parents. They've got to get on the same page. And consistent, you know, 
consistent, um, you know, expectations, both at home and at school. So we have another audience member who is 17 years old. She's a girl, and she says she is scared to death to go back to school because of bullying. How well, do you deal with that? We talked a, a little bit about this, but I'd love to hear a little more how you dealt with it and what schools can do to protect well, kids on the spot. Sometimes at a point where I would say, jerk her out, finish up online, and get her working. She's old. I don't know if this person's fully verbal. I'd finish her up online and get her out in the workplace. We don't have enough emphasis on getting people working. The employment le unemployment levels on high-end autism is absolutely atrocious. And then when I go over to the meatpacking plant, there's an old hippie there that's been there forever that I know that's on the spectrum, and he runs a maintenance shop. And there's another guy on the spectrum that runs a metal fabrication shop. And that's one of the reasons why I think taking skilled trades out is so horrible because there's a lot of these kids that are kind of different, maybe mild autism, maybe somewhat dyslexic, where auto mechanics would be a great job, and there's tons and tons of job openings, diesel mechanics, auto mechanics, and people to fix electrical wires. You know, those are all, um, you know, really, you know, good jobs. And, and uh, we've got to think about what's the ultimate thing in school. Now, sometimes the bullying, you know, can be dealt with, but I've, I've told some parents, just take them out. I was one of the kids that did not work in a large conventional high school. My little small um, uh, elementary school worked, but a large conventional high school was a mess, and I ended up having to go to a boarding school for gifted kids with emotional problems. Because you remember, this is the 60s. And I did no, no school work for the first three years. The boy, I cleaned out a lot of horse stalls, and I ran the horse barn, <laughs> and I learned how to work. Now, I'd like to know a little more about this 17-year-old. Is he fully verbal? Is he working at grade level? You know, if he is, I'd be inclined to pull him out, finish him up online, and get him working. We've got to get these people in, uh, employed. The thing that makes me crazy is I go back and forth between the different silos, like Silicon Valley, meatpacking plants, the cattle industry, a music folklore festival. I'm seeing old gray hair people that are on the mild end of the spectrum, people my age on the autism spectrum, employed in good jobs they've kept all their life. And I think one of the problems now is kind of, they're not learning any work skills. You know, in the 50s, they pounded in enough social rules so that people were holding a job. I can think of kids I went to college with that would be labeled on the spectrum today, and they're running businesses today. And they've had jobs that they've held and they've kept, decent jobs. Hey, Temple, I've, I've heard you speak in the past um, – about growing up by the values of Roy Rogers and, um, and how that was important to you and an important part uh, of how you learn to interact with society. Can you talk about, just explain to our audience briefly who Roy Rogers is? Well, Roy Rogers uh, And then talk a, about the role of values uh, you know, in bringing up a child on the spectrum. Well, in, in the early 50s, Roy Rogers was a children's TV show about a cowboy on a horse, sort of like the Lone Ranger. And you can look up on the Internet, Roy Rogers Rules for Living. And it had things like respect for your parents, be kind. One of the uh, guidance things in it was help the weak. Now we have these awful shows on TV, survivor shows, where you throw the weak off the team. What happened to teamwork? I think we need to be going back to Roy Rogers Rules for Living. You can download them off the Internet, and, and uh, you know, we'd probably be a better place if we did more living you know, by that. Um, one special education director is asking, how do you recognize the difference between a child being truly overwhelmed and actively engaging in manipulation? Okay, that's a difficult thing. Um, you know, first of all, let's look at how much stimulation is, is really going on. Um, also, I tend to think in specific examples, and this would be something, um, you know, I'd need to talk to the teacher. If the child is only partially verbal, for example, it might be more likely to be overwhelmed. But I did some manipulation. I found I could throw a little fit in French class, which I hated, when I was in elementary school and get put out in the hall, and that's exactly what I wanted. You know, this is where you have to be a really, really good, really, really good detective. And then there's stuff that's so much more obvious, like the kids that get overprotected. You know, I'll be at a conference, and uh, a parent will come up with a, maybe a boy that's maybe 10 years old, fully verbal, and mom's doing all the talking, I said, I want to hear, and I'll point to the kid, and I'll say, I want to hear from you. You tell me, you know, you know, I want to talk to you. You know, they, the uh, kids got to learn how to do the talking. You know, we would go out to restaurants. I had to learn how to order food. 
I had to look the waitress in the eye. You know, I was taught those things. You know, I'm seeing too many kids where they're they're getting kind of coddled. Uh, because the other problem now we've got with autism, now they've taken Asperger's out, you've got this huge spectrum going some, from somebody that's fully verbal that should be working in Silicon Valley uh, or to somebody that's going to have to be in a supervised living situation that gets overwhelmed every time he goes in the supermarket. You know, I look at a lot of things, sort of level of, the, you know, that's something where to figure that out, I'd need to talk to that teacher and ask quite a few more questions, and then I could figure it out. We have a question from a parent here. They say, Temple, do you recommend that a person on the spectrum always see a speech therapist to develop speech before they see a behavioral therapist, or can these therapies happen at the same time? Well, I think these therapies can happen at the same time, and that's what was done with me. I mean, I was, um, uh, my mother also hired a nanny who taught me all the turn-taking stuff and taught me table manners. Um, no, you do, and when you've got a little kid, you see, again, I don't know the age of the child here either. If it's a two- or three-year-old that's not talking, we've got to get lots of hours of one-on-ones in, like right now, without waiting. Um, well, the other thing is the kid has speech problems. If he doesn't have speech problems, maybe he doesn't need to go to a speech therapist. I mean, this is where I've got to have a little more specific information to, to fully answer that question. So we have another question, um, this one from a teacher here. She says, what social skills supports have you found that are available for parents to access? Schools can work on social skills, but family needs, families need support in what this is as well. Well, let's just, you know, on teaching autistic, let's just start with table manners. The old-fashioned way, we would go to my grandmother's for Sunday dinner, and uh, the rule was I had to sit for um, uh, 20 minutes, and, and if I, I could ask to be excused, but if dessert wasn't served, I didn't get it. You know, and I was taught how to put my utensils in the proper positions. I was just taught. I was taught to shake hands. Kids need to learn how to shop. How do you go in and buy something? How do you talk to the clerk, give them the credit card or the money? They've got to learn those things. You know, it's just teaching the basic skills. You see, and this is where on the milder end of the spectrum, I think the 50s upbringing actually helped. Now, in the 50s, unfortunately, the, the more severe kids, they used to just throw them away in institutions, which was totally horrible. But the kids that were fully verbal and socially awkward, I mean, kids, all kids were just taught, you know, uh, the social rules, how you do stuff. So this, this next question is from a parent. Uh, she says, what does a parent do when a teacher, quote, unquote, doesn't believe your child has Asperger's? because you as a parent are doing so much to help them with their needs. I feel like my child has had a good start, so he is coping okay for now in school. But if he doesn't get the consistency in class, he is going to start hurting further down. Well, the problem is, first of all, this question is too abstract. I don't know what's going on in the class. This is something where I've got to have more information. And first of all, let's get away from the Asperger's or the autism. Let's start addressing what the actual problem is you know they they um you know if he's really really mild the problem he's having in the classroom might not have anything to do with asperger's you see i don't have enough information to answer this great so here is our last question for today temple you have an audience of 3800 educators and school leaders for this webinar these are the people along with the parents who are really shaping the lives of children on the spectrum what are the key lessons we should all carry forward from today? First of all, develop the child's strengths. My ability in art was always encouraged. Another kid might be in mathematics. If the third grader can do sixth grade or high school math, let them do the, the high school math. Don't hold them back. Build up on the strength. We also have got to just teach um, you know, basic social skills. The other big thing, especially on the high end of the spectrum, is work skills. And that needs to start in middle school. If there's a paper route around, put the kid on the paper route. Or he could walk dogs for people. Or he could um, set up uh, chairs at the community center. Or he could work at the farmer's market. They've got to learn work skills. They've got to learn that discipline and responsibility of having a job. Because the unemployment situation is just awful. And then when I go out to the meatpacking plant or the uh, cowboy festival or uh, go out to Silicon Valley, I see all these undiagnosed Asperger's, usually older ones, in good jobs that they've, they've kept. 
you've got to stretch these kids. You cannot do a sudden surprise. You can't just chuck them in the deep end of the pool, but you've got to stretch them just slightly outside their comfort zone to get them to develop. Also give them choices. When I was 15, I didn't want to go to my aunt's ranch, so I had a choice. I could go for a week or I could go all summer. Or we want to get the kid out of the house, you could give them a choice. You could go in this uh, sailboat class or you could play baseball. You know, give them a choice. Uh, you're going to get an hour of video game playing a day. We've got to limit the video game playing. You can play them when you first get home or you can play them after dinner so that there's some choices. And this helps prevent the no. Another place where a line was drawn in the sand with me, I could not just become a recluse in my room. And I'm too often on the high end of the spectrum. I'm hearing he's 21. I can't get him out of the basement. And he's never been taught any work skills. Sometimes um, they need a little medication for that. And if you're interested in that, you can read Thinking in Pictures, Believer in Biochemistry. I describe my experiences with antidepressants for stopping anxiety. But um, too many of these, especially on the high end of the spectrum, are becoming recluses in their room. And, and that's one place where my school absolutely would not allow that. In fact, when I got too nervous and I didn't want to go to the movie night, they had Friday night, Mr. Patey, the, ma the headmaster, said, you have a choice. You can become a projectionist or you can watch in the audience. So I became the projectionist. He gave me a choice by letting me run the movie projector. You know, I, but not going was not going to be one of the options. These are, these are some of the things. And we've got to get a lot more outcome-oriented. And um, uh, these high end, the kids on the high end of the spectrum have got to be learning work skills long before they graduate. They need to get jobs before they graduate from high school. Uh, the other thing is put the skilled trades back in. I would guess that maybe for 20%, 20 to 25% of the people on the high end, fully verbal end of the autism spectrum, a skilled trade like auto mechanic or certified welder or um, you know cooking or sewing or something like that would be a great uh, career. Um, there's tons of jobs right now for welders and for auto mechanics and for utility line workers. Uh, these are great jobs. They're two-year community college degrees. But we've got to get the kids hooked on that stuff. They don't work for everybody. The kids that are the history buffs, the word thinkers, they would do poorly at skilled trades. You know, it's not for everybody, but um, we've got to get a lot more outcome-based. Uh, you know, what's the ultimate goal of education? To get out and become a contributing member of society. There it is. Thank you, Temple, for sharing your insights, experiences, and wisdom. And thank you to our audience today for all your thought-provoking questions. This webinar was the first of a three-part series, Changing Minds, sponsored by Presence Learning. The inspiration for the series, including Temple's talk, is the growing number of autistic students in our schools, along with a huge number of cases of ADD, ADHD, and other developmental disorders. Administrators and teachers are looking for advice on how to manage disruptive behavior that is often associated with these students' different minds. At the same time, so many things are changing about how we educate children with neurodevelopmental issues, from the research to the evidence-based practices to the common core and its focus on communication and social skills. So we, as educators, need to change our own minds and approaches to be able to provide the individualized education that every child both needs and deserves. And then, from there, we need to work to change the minds of our peers so that improvements are not just restricted to the world of special education. To help provide practical strategies for ways forward, we're bringing you the advice and perspective of the world's top experts in the field to help sort out fact from fiction for neurodevelopmental disorders. Up next in the series, in behavior management, is Barry Prezant with a talk on what today's kids need to know and what SPED leaders need to know as well. Dr. Barry Prezant is from the Center for the Study of Human Development at Brown University. We'll wrap up the series with Dr. Jordan Wright, a leading clinical psychologist and author of the standard textbook on assessment. He will share some exciting developments about online counseling and how this approach can help you help today's kids. We're happy to announce a special promotion on Temple Grandin's books and videos at shautism.com. That's shautism.com. Use the promo code TG213 by February 28th and receive 10% off your order.
The code, once again, is TG213, and it gets you 10% off your order. Thank you from everyone here at Presence Learning. We're committed to helping you by providing very personalized online therapy with the best therapists who will ease your burden and extend your resources, helping educator and student alike. If you'd like more information about online speech and occupational therapy or online counseling, or if you'd like a demo, please email us at schools at presencelearning.com. And finally, please take a moment to fill out our post webcast survey at plearn.co slash grandin hyphen survey. That's p-l-e-a-r-n dot c-o slash grandin hyphen survey. Your feedback is important to us to make these webcasts as useful and informative as possible. Thanks again for joining us. Enjoy the rest.